You took on to write a biography of Howard Zinn, the author of the most well-selling history, I think, in the 20th century, a people's history of the United States. How do you think history will remember Howard, primarily as an activist, as a historian, which? I think, well, historians are very split about Howard. Uh, if we're talking about how he'll go down in history, how he'll be remembered. Uh, there are those who think he was a mere popularizer who, you know, wrote a history of uh, villains and heroes and nothing in between. Uh, I think he was a very good historian, though I have my own problems with the people's history, which I do write about in the biography. Uh, but he was also a marvelous human being. Uh, he was gentle and generous, uh, uh, a lovely man. I knew him somewhat. We were never close friends. Mm. Your book, Howard Zinn, A Life on the Left, does trace his history. Tell us a little bit about how he grew up, where, his parents. He grew up in, uh, in poverty, essentially. Bo both his parents had uh, fifth grade, sixth grade educations. Uh, they were both uh, Jewish immigrants. He grew up in Brooklyn. Uh, they kept moving apartments because uh, that was the only way to stay ahead of the landlord. Uh, they'd get a free month's rent, move in, then move out at the end of the free month. Uh, so Howard was, in, in a real sense, born class conscious. During World War II, he was a bombardier. Uh, and one surprise for me when I, when I went to the archives, the family opened up all the papers to me. Uh, I expected, you know, Howard to be a reluctant soldier, uh, serving essentially against his will. Uh, but there's a real gap there. And in trying to figure out why there was no at least inner protest, I, I think... Uh, Howard didn't see the destruction that the bombs were creating. I mean, they flew so high above the scenes below that he never saw the violence. He went back. The, uh, their very last bombing mission was to destroy a German garrison that was simply sitting, waiting for surrender in the small town of Ronan in France. And he later went back, uh, soon after the war, uh, and was filled with remorse. Uh, the town had been essentially leveled, uh, and a, a huge number of people killed. I was in the Air Force for two and a half years, and dropped bombs on Berlin, dropped bombs on various cities in Germany, and Hungary, and Czechoslovakia, and even bombed a little town in France. Uh, towards the very end of the war, and this was a strange one, and one that had a very profound effect on me later as I thought about it. And uh, The war actually in Europe was about over. It was a few weeks from being over, and everybody knew it. But we were awakened in the middle of the night, to, and they told us we were going to bomb this little town in France because there were several thousand German soldiers around the town. They weren't doing anything, weren't bothering anyone. They were just waiting for the war to end. But we were going to go over and bomb them. Now, the one odd thing about it, they told us we were not going to carry the usual demolition bombs, 500-pound demolition bombs. Uh, we were going to carry instead 30 canisters, 100-pound canisters of jellied gasoline. That's what it was called. Of course, later I learned this was napalm, the first use of napalm in the European theater. And you know, when you're bombing from 30,000 feet, you don't hear anything, you don't see anything, you don't know what's happening to people down there, you, you don't hear people screaming, you don't see blood, you don't see mangled limbs, none of that. Uh, and uh, several thousand people were killed, Germans were killed, French were killed, and it uh, wasn't until really after the war, maybe after I learned about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and began to think about bombing, and began to question the total goodness of the good war. Only then did I go think about Royan and that bombing.
He talked about it later in his ongoing questioning of the role of violence and of war. Um, we'll get to that, but your book talks <coughs> about his theories of change more broadly, and it comes up consistently. T theories of change around um, history, also theories of education, theories of the role of history. He was trying to figure out, it seems like, throughout his life, um, what his work's role was, as well as his mm. own his own personal role. Focusing for a minute on the role of uh, history, what did he think history was for? Uh, I I think one of the great uh, Howard as exemplar uh, is is I think precisely in this area. He thought that. Yes, we are professional historians, professional doctors, whatever, but we are also citizens, which means that it should be automatic that we feel some sense of responsibility for the issues of the day. Do you think he ever got depressed and thought maybe he was wrong about people changing history? Uh, the, there are a couple of, you know, for Howard, pessimistic remarks. Howard was a... Uh, a a temperamental optimist, uh, you know, very deep down. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but he once in a while says, you know, although I've presented material that is often left out of the ordinary textbooks, like worker strikes, uh, people realizing uh, their circumstances and becoming determined to do something to improve them, uh, I've come across a line or two in which he adds something like, even if they don't often succeed. How did he believe change happened? What, was, what became his theory of change? What, how did he believe change happened? He believed change happened collectively, not individually. Uh, and he felt that uh, it was possible uh, for people to gather together, protest injustice, and see a real revision uh, in attitudes and legislation. 